many of our partners we talk to in different parts of the world are very excited about integrating uh, Web3 technology in, in a meaningful way uh, and are excited to push out the forward. Okay, so welcome to the Metaverse Show. Today, we've got a really exciting guest and co-founder and CTO of Aptos, Avery Ching. Welcome, Avery. Great great to meet you, Jamie. So Aptos is described as an X-Gen layer one blockchain with breakthrough technology and programming language Move, which is designed to evolve, improve performance, and strengthen user safeguards. We'll break down each of those key components a little bit later and, and why the world even needs another layer one. Aptos, for those uh, of our avid listeners, or people familiar with Outlier, uh, you would have seen that we've announced recently a collaboration with Aptos uh, and the Move Accelerator. We'll talk a little bit again later about what we're hoping to kind of a- achieve there. Uh, but really, I want to want to make the most of having you as a guest, somebody that is representative of a, a team of engineers that have worked within some of the world's largest web organizations, you know, serving billions of users. And of course, organizations that have tried are trying to, to move into Web3 and, and get your perspective on the whole Web 2.5 kind of theme, but also, you know, how likely it is that we can onboard those billions of users into the world that uh, that we want to exist, the web that we want to exist with, with Web3. Maybe before we get in, into that, um, it'd be great to understand who is Avery, and and to talk a little bit about your co-founding team. I said you're a co-founder. It'd be great to hear more about your background, but also the journey to Aptos in the context of your founding team and and co-founders. Absolutely. Thanks thanks for the opportunity. So just quickly, my background is I was born and raised in Hawaii. I went to a local school there called Punahou and then came to uh, Duke uh, University and graduate school at Northwestern University. In my PhD program, I studied high-performance computing. I worked at some of the largest natural labs across the world, including Argonne and Sandia and Los Alamos, where I helped develop supercomputing software to scale uh, and support different kinds of applications, such as protein folding and finite element analysis. After that, I went to Yahoo work for four years on data infra- on, on web search uh, and joined Facebook in 2011, uh, starting with data infrastructure. Um, I had also co-created a project called Apache Giraffe, which is a large-scale graph processing infrastructure that could do things like do uh, page rank, triangle counting, matrix factorization, and at Meta, I was very lucky to work in the next seven years on building out the technology stack for data infrastructure, uh, developing our implementation of MapReduce called Corona, working on Hive, introducing Spark into the warehouse, as well as taking Draft and launching it as a product. Uh, when I left, I was kind of leading all the batch analytics teams uh, and went to leave because uh, there was a more interesting project going on in Meta at the time, which is called Libra, being spun up uh, in the early days of 2018. And so in th- 2018, uh, I joined this amazing team of you know, senior engineers, researchers, scientists across many different disciplines, including programming languages, systems, consensus, security, cryptography, and we decided to build out a couple of different interesting stacks of technology, one of which was the Move programming language, uh, a different way of thinking about how to write smart contracts and how to get fastest time to market in a safe and scalable way, and also the DM blockchain, which was a, a new technology stack to support essentially the fastest decentralized database in the world. Fast forward a couple of years, you know, developed something that was ready for our mainnet in private, uh, but unfortunately could not launch well, but we are meta. And in uh, late 2021, uh, we started a company called Aptos Labs, in collaboration with my co-founder, Mo Sheikh, and many of the other kind of founding members are, are from the original uh, DM team that came with us. Uh, our goal and mission is essentially how do we kind of build and scale the decentralized internet for everyone. Um, when we were thinking at Meta about the goals in, of, of, of what we're trying to achieve from a decentralization standpoint, we were, th- were you know, inspired by the likes of Bitcoin and Ethereum and other technologies that were beginning to build at that point. Uh, and we wanted to really address the notion of how do we kind of bring the billions of people at Meta it safely and scale it into Web3. And that was kind of our intent when we started the company. And so we think it begins, of course, with the kind of core technology that actually is able to scale from an infrastructure standpoint. But it also is about how do we solve those user challenges um, in, that today still exist? Like how do, you, how do you kind of make wallets a more scalable experience for people that are not technology um, you know, savvy and inclined? And how do we make sure people don't lose their funds uh, with respect to like, you know, key loss and, and password recovery. So 
those are the, some of the key challenges. And also on the infrastructure side, while people build a, think building a blockchain is the, the only thing that's there, there are many other services around it that are very important. How do you have API services, replication services, indexing services that can support the use cases uh, that they need to reach, you know, hundreds of millions of people. Um, and so that's kind of the focus of the company and, and where we are right now. So really interesting stuff. Lots lots to pull out there. I think, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but I, I think it is interesting to understand what was the original mandate you were given as a team whilst in Facebook to explore uh, Libra and DM? We were actually given a very flexible mandate. Uh, the idea was, how do we take blockchain technology and explore different use cases for it within Meta specifically? And I think the use case that became the first one that was interesting was around mit- remittances. And so building out a payment network as, as part of the DM payment network was something that was kind of the first and primary use case. That being said, move and the DM blockchain were also designed just to be more generalized purpose, uh, decentralized infrastructure and be used for any kind of use case going forward. Remittances seem like a very important uh, case to solve and still is today. When you think about the amount of money that's moved in those cases, the amount of fees involved, and also the, the time and delays in terms of getting the money to the people that need it the most. You know, fast forward now, your, your own thing, your agents of your own destinies. I guess, is there anything that's changed in, in, in the vision? Um, now you're kind of not shackled by the constraints, both in internal and external, that would be placed upon you whilst you're in an organization like Facebook? Uh, I, I think you, you've hit it on the head, really. We, we At this point in time, what we can do is not just you know, go beyond our original mandate, which is how do we kind of solve remittances, but really solving challenges in different spaces of the internet industry. And you know, we, we think ourselves as having a very broad mission here, which is what cloud computing has done for internet applications uh, in terms of being able to provide scalable services, scalable infrastructure, to support the largest applications of the world, including things like Netflix uh, or, or Instagram or uh, Google. Um, that cloud infrastructure you know, is, a, is a great building block uh, platform for that. We don't have that yet for Web3. We don't have that yet from the blockchain infra- side, from the indexing side, from other parts of how do we support kind of storage and collaboration with blockchain primitives. So that's an area where we want to build up that, that kind of infrastructure and support internet applications uh, with Web3 uh, integration, kind of same way that cloud computing is done for the traditional internet applications of today. That question I, I asked at the top end, you know, why why a, a new layer one, you know, and, and why now? And then also why a new programming language, right? It could seem like an added layer of complexity to adoption. So what, you know, firstly, what, why a layer one? And then why, why do you think it needs its own programming language? I think a new layer one is important if you want to be able to take the technology forward in leaps and bounds going, you know, going to the future. And in, in particular for us, one thing that was a big focus of our project from the very early days is the notion of upgradability. This space is very new and young in terms of technology and technology adoption. And while we have amazing, you know, best in class technology today, it might not be the same technology that kind of takes a hold in the future. And the ability for us to kind of keep changing things and taking the users through that journey without having to switch networks or to, you know, uh, move their assets from one place to another that in a dangerous fashion is something that we felt was very important for long lasting value. Uh, and, and today we launched our mainnet in October. We've already done a major upgrade to our 1.2 release in February, and we're already planning for 1.3, which brings in a whole new notion of consensus uh, primitives that are going to actually accelerate and improve our throughput by leaps and bounds. So being able to kind of keep deploying this network and kind of improving it, like a database that kind of automatically improves over time is something that we felt is very important to not only customer adoption, but customers feeling very uh, comfortable. This technology is something that's not going to be left behind and in the dark in the past. Uh, With respect to new programming language and move, we felt the same same idea. Um, Programming languages uh, for smart contracts platforms is still pretty early in these days. And while we're very, again, inspired by what Solidian's done and, and with tools like Hardhat, uh, which are very impressive for developer infrastructure, we need to evolve these tools very quickly. And Move is an interesting platform, a solid platform for how we think about a whole classes of bugs and in applications that are not possible. And the more we can make it easier for programmers to write applications that have less ways to kind of shoot themselves in, in, you know, uh, in, in, in the foot uh, with respect to making errors, the better for smart contract development, um, enabling more developers to build a build, as well as getting those developers to deploy those contracts more quickly to production. I think, you know, and a good analogy of that is kind of thinking about how Java as a language kind of enabled a whole new class of developers to start programming that, you know, weren't able to do it before because of the complexities of C and C++, for example. That's something I think, you know, Move, Move can do really well. Um, so you mentioned a couple of times this word safety. Clearly, that's I- important 
to the kind of design of the protocol, but presumably its users or its target users um, as developers, as, as enterprise. Could you maybe unpack what, what you mean by safety and, and how you allow for more of it? These databases will not be trusted. The more hacks that are seen, uh, compromises of the system. And these compromises can happen in many different ways. There's kind of low level safety about the con- like the protocols themselves. Are they safe uh, with respect to the kind of assumptions uh, of the network. And so in our case, we we provide kind of fully Byzantine fault tolerant safety with respect to the idea that network can't fork or the network, um, you know, is going to kind of maintain the same history over time uh, as long as those Byzantine conditions are met. Uh, we, we prove those in our in our papers. Um, they've been well tested by numerous researchers as well as formally verified uh, with respect to the protocol. Um, but there's also other safety aspects when you think about, you know, decentralization itself, like is the network well balanced across a number of participants uh, across different countries, different cities? Is it subject to kind of the failure of a, you know, a single data center kind of banning uh, the usage of those validators or, or, a, or a nation or geo- geopolitical area where they decide they don't want to support uh, blockchain technology going forward? So there's that aspect of safety as well. And then kind of finally, the last aspect is around user safety. How can users be transacting with each other and with different kinds of applications in a way that prevents them from being manipulated, from being uh, subject to phishing attacks and to kind of YOLOing and signing transactions, which you don't necessarily understand what those transactions are going to do. So all these things are important for us when we think about the concept of safety and how to provide the best experience possible so that billions of people feel safe to move on, move their internet applications into this space. So you're talking about the kind of upgradability as a way to to future-proof a network. And I know that that was a big argumentation for Gavin Wood and, and, and Polkadot, you know, which I guess in, in his mind is what E2 was, was supposed to be. In, in terms of the network today and its usability, usability and bridging into a wider developer pool, I think it's kind of well known that the penetration of Web3 technology in the context of adoption of developers is relatively low. Um, certainly like sub 10% of all, all developers on the planet are probably not even aware, let alone using any of this stuff that we, we think is really important. Um, and there's this kind of argument, both in terms of the design of the solutions, but then also the kind of configuration of the application, that maybe we need an interim step that is Web, web 2.5. I don't know how, how you feel about that. As somebody coming out of Web 2, you know, thinking about the future of Web3, how do you think about this period of transition and and to what extent does Aptos speak to that as a stack? Our thought is in general, we need to lower the user like barriers to adoption going forward. And so, you know, Web 2.5 can mean a lot of different things, a lot of different people. Um, our goal is kind of how do you take an experience in Web 2.0 and kind of improve it? So how do you, you know, today log into an online banking account? If you lose your password, how do you recover that? Those kind of primitives should exist in Web3 as well. It should be as easy and as fast. And when we think about things like, you know, for instance, latency. Latency is kind of a huge challenge for many different networks today. Um, and I don't know if you saw recently, but the Masari produced a report showing, you know, Aptos is, is sub-second of finality, the fastest, you know, live production network uh, today. We think that that's actually a way to conquer barriers with respect to user experience uh, being at par or even better than some of their Web2, Web2 counterparts. Another aspect might be things around uh, key recovery. You know, today, if you if you forget your password, you have a way to kind of recover your password, get access to your accounts, uh, your banking funds, and all kinds of things like that. Um, the same thing should be true in Web three, where you know even if you have a non custodial wallet and you lose access to uh, your key or you forget it or it gets compromised, how do you gain control of your funds again in a way that balances the control between you? and a custodian, for example. And that's something you can do in Aptos specifically. There are quite a few ways in which we think about the, you know, this journey of Web 2 to Web 3. But in some sense, again, our, our goal is to really exceed the experiences or at least meet, be on par um, uh, with, with them and, and providing the additional capabilities and utility that Web 3 brings to the table. So obviously, uh, this week of recording, um, recent news is that... Um, over at Instagram, the kind of rollout of NFTs is being postponed or, or pulled back. I don't have the kind of the, f- the full details at the moment. But what can we learn from that? And I guess, you know, are there parallels to the whole reason why Aptos was was spun out of Facebook? You know, what what can we learn more generally um, about innovating with, within big tech? But then perhaps more specifically, um, 
what do we think the challenges were in, in, in Instagram and NFTs specifically? I think in general, the, the big tech industry is going through a bit of an upheaval. Uh, we've kind of seen layoffs across the board in many of the largest tech companies in the world. Uh, and unfortunately, some of these projects like, you know, the Web3 initiatives are, are, are being cut in, in a few of them. Now, I, I do, you know, want to say, of, of course, as someone who kind of worked in these four initiatives, I, I feel a little, a little sad. Uh, but I also know that many other large industry partners that we've been talking to are very excited about this space. So I'm also very encouraged to know that it's not something that's happening across the board. Um, definitely in, in a couple of cases like this, we, we definitely see some, some changes. But uh, overall, um, many of our partners that we talk to in different parts of the world are very excited about integrating uh, Web3 technology in, in a meaningful way. Uh, and are excited to push on foot forward. So, I, I, you know, kind of hearing your personal background as a developer engineer, and then also knowing, of course, that you've you've worked within this kind of social media, social platforms space. When you're thinking about the usage of of something like Aptos, and you're thinking about that being able to handle billions of users, um, I'd be really interested to think about um, the kind of scalability component. You know, beyond beyond. The, the kind of necessarily the speed, but then also I'd be interested to think about how, how you're understanding what a web three social graph might look like. Um, uh, you know, can and should that be married with people's existing social graphs? Um, and then also if we're thinking about the usage of networks, might that increasingly need to be uh, in an AI context? So it's less about people using networks and it's more about um, AI and generative AI and agent-based systems that are going to be the, 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 the end user of these things. But maybe maybe we start with kind of the, the data and the scalability and, uh, and work, our way, uh, work our way up towards the, the AI component. Those are great. I think those are three separate questions in one, so hopefully I remember them by the time I get to the third one. But uh, at least the first point about scalability uh, it's definitely an important one. Again, the way the cloud scales, uh, a blockchain should scale as well. And there are different ways to scale your technology. Uh, some of them have gone the path of creating multiple duplicate networks with different consensus protocols and others. Um, that does uh, allow us to scale throughput, uh, but it does so at the cost of user experience, where users have to bridge between different networks. They have different interfaces, potentially different languages. And... Uh, you know, I, I think that costly experience is something that we would not prefer um, from, a, from a path of trying to onboard billions of people. Uh, our approach to scalability is a bit different. Uh, we take a approach where the software stack itself has been designed to be modular and pipelined. And so when we think about transaction processing, we break up into five different stages. The first stage is data dissemination. The second stage is ordering. The third stage is parallel execution. The fourth stage is batch updates. Uh, and then the fifth stage is um, proof generations and certification. And so by breaking these five different stages, each of these stages can run in parallel. That's, the, that's a really nice concept. The other, the other thing is that each of these stages can be done independently. And so by being able to um, split these, this work into different areas on the software stack, we can also scale out from a single machine into, say, multiple CPUs, uh, multiple SSDs or, or hard drives in the back end, and also going to eventually multiple machines over time. And this ability then allows the network to kind of grow as the re demands grow on top of it. And we believe this will provide a very good path in terms of supporting the largest applications in the world. With your second question around the social graph, um, you bring up a great, uh, great point. I was uh, very fortunate to be along the journey of Facebook scaling to billions of daily active users uh, and, and, as met, and with Instagram as well. And so as did many of the other folks on our team. In fact, many of our team actually are from, from both those, those products and have worked on scaling those products to immense, immense, uh, immense size. Um, we are very fortunate to have that experience and, and leveraging that experience in terms of thinking about how we develop a social platform and some of the primitives is definitely something that we're excited about. And uh, to those who might be building on Aptos, it's an area that we should definitely talk about if you're, if you're interested in doing. Um, we don't have anything in that to announce in that space, but suffice to say that it requires um, a mixture of different things. One, of course, is going to be scalability from the point of being able to kind of put these connections on chain and support the modification of these corrections in a very fast, uh, with fast throughput and low latency. But the other aspect is going to be with respect to how do we kind of maintain privacy between certain amounts of information that are trans, trans um, that are trend being transferred between two different users or groups of users going forward. And we have a number of interesting technologies in that space that we're developing, including the notion of veiled coins and others. 
Um, your third question was really about how does AI fit the picture? And you know, I'm also fortunate here to have some some of the background in in the um, ML space uh, with working on my uh, my best experience on data analytics, which is also including things like matrix factorization with Apache Draft. And I think this space is is truly interesting when you when you kind of combine the notion of AI and blockchain together. Blockchain can be an amazing platform as input data for AI, and actually even provide a, an incredible you know. Um, so, so first of all, as a source of data, it, it can be indexed, it can be put into a search engines, it can be uh, supporting different things like ChatGPT going forward. ChatGPT itself can be used as a way to help develop uh, and implement um, smart contracts and providing uh, ways to, can, again, like uh, things that the Move Prover does to kind of formally verify certain aspects of your contracts. ChatGPT can also be an assistant in terms of how you program and how do you uh, develop more efficiently, especially in a new language, which very few are familiar with. Um, uh, so we, we do believe there's a really amazing potential in AI when it comes to either using AI to help aid in developing blockchain technologies and applications, as well as AI being uh, blockchain being a source of data for AI going forward in the future. And even thinking about platforms where uh, AI can be um, more easily incentivized uh, through the blockchain as a way of rewarding contributions towards distributed and federated learning. So there's just a whole host of activities that we think, you know, are exciting in the spaces of, of social, of AI, of what we're doing in blockchain development. And we're, we're excited to help see those projects uh, make amazing progress going forward. Yeah, and I think it's really important for you know people who are thinking about Web3 applications to be thinking in that context, right? Chat GPT's fastest growing um, web app ever, um, first to a million, and then like to whatever the next level was, I think it's 10 million. Um, and, um, you know, in, in a matter of weeks, right? And I think that really points to the direction, the kind of speed, velocity of um, innovation and potential. Um, and as you say, h- huge amounts of opportunity for, for how blockchain-like infrastructure can um, can better enable um, AI, in particular generative AI. So, so look, I mean, clearly, incredibly credible team um, and a great brain trust for founders to be able to, to tap into as they themselves are now looking to kind of build, um, you know, billion, billion user applications on the network. Um, but building a layer one, all the kind of middleware and tooling that goes with it, um, it is a big undertaking. I mean, you guys have raised a, a, a really good amount of capital, about 400 million from uh, a number of luminaries, A16Z, Jump, uh, Crypto, Tiger Global, Multicoin, PayPal, Coinbase Venture. So you, you kind of got a who's who uh, on, on the cap table. You've got a, a good war chest, um, but still relative to uh, a lot of the other layer ones, you know, how, how do you guys think you'll, you'll compete, right, starting um, from the, the, the point that you are now? Yeah, I think jumpstarting an, an ecosystem from the beginning is always a, it's a one-off case. It's very interesting. It's almost like building a country from scratch. Uh, and we've been really fortunate to have a lot of supporters with respect to the investors in, in our project, but also the people who put an investment in terms of the time and effort and the developer community that's come behind us to kind of make this project a, a huge success going forward. And so when we launched our developer network back in March of last year, we were really trying to understand the interest in this project, interest in Move, interest in a new blockchain. And we were just fascinated to see that within days of our our developer network going live, our Discord community bloomed up. Uh, People started asking questions about Move, how they develop different types of applications around smart contracts, AMMs, um, swaps, all the kind of fun things you'd expect. And then, you know, slowly, another thing that happened that we did not expect is that People started to run full nodes and connect to the uh, the network, and I think after a week or two, we had eighteen thousand full nodes connected, uh, re- replicating the data services of a developer network, making it one of the largest uh, networks in the world uh, at that time. Which which gave us a lot of confidence that we were doing the right things going forward. And as we kind of saw um, that inspiration, we did, we had a hackathon, a very small one, uh, back in May uh, at our office to see like how developers would feel, uh, more hands on and see what they could build in 36 hours. And there were developers that kind of came in actually from across the country and even outside of the country. And it was pretty interesting to see people with such excitement for something that you know was new, wasn't launched yet, um, and just interested in learning more about Move and about kind of Aptos and what was formerly the DM technology stack going forward. People built amazing applications, games, marketplaces, wallets in that small period of time. And that also gave us high confidence that this was something that would would hopefully change, change the world over time. 
Um, we had three different test nets um, to test different aspects of the system and then launched our main net in October. Uh, and our main net launch, we had a very robust ecosystem launch with more than 30 projects going live in the first day or two. Uh, and now five months later, we've seen more than 100 projects go live uh, and, and, and huge amounts of momentum, including our recent hackathon in Seoul, where more than 400 participants <laughs> signed up for a space of like 150 and more than 50 projects were presented in the kind of final judging um, panel. So amazing interest, uh, not just here in the United States, but worldwide uh, and a community that spans, you know, across the globe. So we've been super excited about the response. Uh, the other thing we do, I think that works really well is keep good contact with our developer community. We, we engage in discord. We talk with them in different telegram groups and Slack channels and everywhere they're, you know, they want to be, we want to meet them there. A lot of our features are driven through the developers themselves. So recently we announced 100x gas reduction in execution costs. Uh, and that was something that they, they felt was very important in terms of enabling certain types of applications, especially in the DeFi space. Uh, so that kind of pairing is also very powerful in terms of helping to inspire uh, people to build in the platform. Yeah, and look, clearly, you know, we're, we're very excited about working with you at Outlier. Um, we haven't actually uh, announced a new protocol partner in some time. We're being um, very selective. Um, and we've been really excited, um, not just by the kind of team behind this, but also the, the kind of traction in, in the community. We think it it, it already um, really justifies its own dedicated program. So, um, you know, we're really excited on working that through with you. So the program that we're going to be running, um, we're recruiting now. Um, I think we're one third or, or halfway through that recruitment cycle. Um, it's going to be a 12 week program. Um, it will take place in Palo Alto um, uh, and uh, be able to access kind of your brilliant team that you've got there and a network and provide 100,000 in funding. Um, and applications will be open uh, all the way in through until mid April. So um, if you're building in a space or interested in building a space, definitely reach out to either of us and apply. But um, I guess, so for us, this is the first uh, in-person acceleration program we've run since uh, COVID uh, started. Um, and uh, it's the first time we've we've done anything, um, you know, effectively in the West Coast and Silicon Valley. Um, and, you know, that is... That, that can be quite a controversial thing in the context of Web3, right? You know, it, um, in the same way it wants to destroy Wall Street, you know, there's a lot of talk about destroying Silicon Valley. So, you know, why do you think, what do you think the role of Silicon Valley is in the future of Web3? And why do you think it's important that we're doing this in person uh, in, in Palo Alto? It's a great, great set of questions. Um, I'll answer like a little bit roundabout way, but definitely... Us being in person, uh, being able to kind of work together as a team, a team that knows each other very well for many, many years, and also a team that um, kind of built this technology for a long time, so very familiar with the stack as well, helped us to get to launch very quickly and be very productive. Um, and so we, we think that, that we'd like to carry that culture forward as, as being like in person is very helpful with respect to developing things quickly. And so we are remote friendly company, absolutely. We have people across the world working on Aptos, um, but our ability to kind of come together and and move quickly uh, in terms of decision making and also being able to build those relationships where people trust each other has paid off in huge dividends for us. And we love to take the same approach with um, with you and Outlier in terms of having that team around us. Uh, we ran a kind of our first kind of in-house accelerator based on the team that showed up at the May Hackathon last year. And the, out, the, the outputs have been pretty, pretty incredible in terms of the number of teams that came out and the funding they received. Uh, and and we, we're looking forward to taking this to the next level, really, with um, with what Outlier is doing and, and actually our kind of new office that we are excited about sharing with others. And so maybe to kind of close off, obviously, there's the week of recording this. Um, I don't know if we call it post Silicon Valley Bank or it, it's kind of, you know, maybe st still in process to a degree. Um, and the spotlight, I guess, that it, it put on Silicon Valley. Um, what do you think the the role and future of Silicon Valley is in Web3 and, and the future of the web? It's hard to say the role of Silicon Valley in particular is there's definitely a lot of talent here with respect to technical talent um, and, you know, entrepreneurial talent as well. Um, and definitely, you know, I think the, the the banking issues we've seen in the past, we, we love to see decentralization, hope to address and solve some of these problems. They can't solve all the problems obviously going forward, but definitely starting to play a role in terms of how we think about 
uh, diversifying across different, you know, different providers. And that's kind of really what the blockchain is when you think about it, right? We're just diversifying the risk across multiple validators going forward, full nodes, different entities. And the idea that a single entity can't control everything is really important and key to stability in, you know, not only uh, in the blockchain and crypto space, but also in the, you know, more global financial markets. So we, we hope, you know, this is going to lead to much more, uh, you know, changes going forward that, that support this kind of narrative and initiative. And so finally, um, what are you most excited about for this year? What are you hoping the kind of use cases um, are going to be built on, on Aptos uh, or even maybe a h- highlighting some that are already happening that, that you're really excited about? Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of projects that are coming on board uh, that we're excited about. I think more than 200 projects are building today. Uh, then just some very exciting partnerships and some of the spaces that we've been focusing on the most. Uh, so the four areas that we've been focusing on have been the gaming space, uh, the social media space, the finance space, as well as media and entertainment more broadly. Uh, and each of those, we kind of have some some marquee uh, partnerships that we're really pumped about. Uh, but I just, just I know we're running out of time, so I'll just pick a couple. Uh, first of yeah. all, in gaming, we have uh, Mpixel, which is a AAA gaming studio out of South Korea that have built this Grand Saga title, which with millions of users on it. And they're developing a brand new version called Grand Saga Unlimited uh, uh, for Web3 built on top of Aptos and taking advantage of Aptos's unique capabilities with respect to uh, super high transaction throughput and being able to do things like on-chain gameplay. Um, so that's one game that's gonna be coming out uh, this year that we're super pumped uh, and excited to see. Um, there are a lot of folks that are really pushing the narrative in that space. And because a lot of game platforms are just maybe you know, not sure about Web3, they're adding little bits and pieces into it. Uh, what we really love about Mpixels is they're pushing the boundaries here with respect to things like proof of play and other aspects that um, are hopefully gonna shape the narrative for, for all of Web3 gaming going forward. Uh, on the social media space, we're excited about our partnership with Shingari with already more than 45 million monthly active users. It's already a, a viral hit in its own way. Uh, and the aspects of Web3 that they integrate with respect to being able to, to pay creators for their for their contributions, being able to um, build those relationships between uh, creators and fans in a, in a different you know way that's not possible without blockchain is something that we're really excited about. They've already got millions of users on the blockchain and we're excited to see their growth on top of Aptos as they launch their next version of their application going forward. Um, we also have a really amazing partner called Kid Labs, who's developing ticketing solutions uh, for different kinds of events. And the idea of kind of keeper distribution, which is what Kid KYD stands for, is something that is going to be a new model with respect to um, event organization and how the event organizers connect more closely with fans uh, and be able to offer things like loyalty programs directly and also be an interface layer so that other third party applications can build on top of that as well. Uh, so just, just a couple of highlights of some of the applications that I'm excited about. There are many other things going on in different spaces. Um, and, uh, you know, we're also excited, of course, with the accelerator program we'll bring in the near future. Yeah, well, look, thanks for joining us. I think that, I mean, we're, we're obviously very excited about the, the program specifically. And again, I would encourage people to apply outlierventures.io slash Basecamp. Um, but I think just more generally, what Aptos represents for the industry at large, the fact that we are attracting people like yourselves from, you know, deep in the bowels of uh, big tech, um, you know, moving over full time into the space, I think is great. Um, uh, is a great testament to the maturity of the space or the fact that it is maturing, should we say. Um, and um, uh, really excited to, to see everything that happens on the Aptos Network over the course of this year. So thanks for joining us, Avery. Thank you very much, Jamie.